My name is Mr. Phonograph, and I'm not so very old. My father, he's called Edison, and I'm worth my weight in gold. And the folks, they just yell into my mouth, and now I'm saying what's true. For just speak to me, I'll speak it back, and you'll see I can talk like you. My name is Mr. Phonograph, and I'm not so very old. My father, he's called Edison, and I'm worth my weight in gold. On December 7th, 1877, Thomas Edison took a train from his little lab in Menlo Park, New Jersey, to New York City, went to the offices of the Scientific American Magazine, walked into the editor's office, and placed a machine exactly like this onto the editor's desk, and proceeded to turn the crank. Hopefully his didn't tear. <laughs> that is definitely one of the risks of tinfoil. But as you can see, for all of the lack of clarity, <clears throat> it was still recognizable, understandable, and it created an absolute sensation. The editors of the Scientific American went totally crazy over this unbelievable accomplishment, <clears throat> despite the fact that this had been in the works for a long time. The Scientific American published in its November 6th issue in 1877, or I'm sorry, the uh, November 14th issue, which came out on November 6th, um, a wonderful invention, speech capable of indefinite repetition from automatic records. So this was not really a surprise, but the actual happening, the actual doing of the promise was a surprise, and it was an instant success, <clears throat> despite its unbelievable crudeness. This was the first prototype that had been made, this is literally the first prototype, <clears throat> it had been made the day before Edison's visit to New York, and it was pretty much put together from spare parts. The, the base had been used in a telegraph experiment, the rest of it was machined specifically for it. You'll notice that there are two recording heads. It's actually, this is the recording head and this is the reproducing head. Uh, the recording head had a steel diaphragm, this had a mica diaphragm. Edison very quickly discovered that he got much better recordings when they were recorded on the mica and played back on the mica. Consequently, this was the only tinfoil phonograph to have a single, I mean, to have two separate speakers. <clears throat> From then on, the same speaker was used for recording and playing back. This was a sensation, as has been discussed earlier. It blew people's minds. It put Edison on the map in a way that was unimaginable. He was, up till then, really not known outside of telegraph circles. His work was minimally known to the public. But this, if you use the right button, it works better. This put him on the map. <clears throat> and the demand was great, so Edison needed to make a quick improvement on the phonograph. So the second machine that he designed looked like this. <clears throat> now, it was much easier to use than the first one, but it was still relatively crude. You know, I've worked with this machine, and it's really not that simple to use. Over the weekend of New Year's, he presented this machine to the public at Western, the offices of Western Union New York. Thousands of people came, but Edison quickly discovered that there was one problem. As originally displayed, this flywheel was not included. And with a very tiny crank, it was difficult to maintain the speed. So immediately after going back to the lab in early January, he added the flywheel. This machine quickly became the tinfoil phonograph. This is the most familiar thing. Now, this is one of the things that interests me <clears throat> about tinfoil <laughs> phonographs and collectors. Pretty much everybody knows the tinfoil phonograph. Most collectors, uh, record collectors, have seen a tinfoil phonograph, but it's kind of a generic concept. And what I want to show now is that the tinfoil phonograph was really a very complex and very rapid development. But in the early stages, this was it. <clears throat> this was the machine. And in April, April 18th, 1878, Edison took this machine to Washington, D.C. to present to the Academy of Sciences in Washington. 
it was, again, a sensation. <clears throat> they had to take the doors off of the hall to let people in the hallway see this thing. Edison himself did not record. He sat on the stage and let his assistant do the actual demonstration. The next day, he went to the uh, offices of M Matthew Brady, <clears throat> the famous Civil War photographer, and posed for this photograph and a, a series of several others, all in the exact same pose with a very, very somber look. This was really the turning point for Edison. <clears throat> the phonograph put him on the map, created a tremendous amount of interest, a lot of uh, press, but this photograph was the equivalent of Edison being on the cover of People magazine. Once you were photographed by Brady and Brady sold your, your pictures to the public, you were a celebrity, which was a term even back then. The machine that Edison used, which commonly is called the Brady, because it was illustrated, and that photograph is the most uh, common, best-known photograph of Edison. That machine appeared in the press endlessly for the entire spring of 1878. And obviously, the press loved it, the public loved it, it was a sensation at every single level. But one of the things that Edison confronted was an excess of demand. He had people streaming into his lab, <clears throat> interrupting his work, literally just driving him crazy because he couldn't possibly spend all that time. They had plans for the phonograph. They recognized that it really was very crude technology even then. And so they were already planning for the potential use of the phonograph, but as a short-term stopgap, to try and quiet some of the public clamor and demand to buy phonographs, <clears throat> on January 8th, 1878, Edison sketched this design of a small demonstration phonograph that could be sold to the public, that could satisfy the demand for the curiosity without impinging on his big plans for exhibitions. The design was deliberately made with a mandrel that was only two inches wide, so that only a very, very short recording could be made. So think, the thinking there was that it would not be possible to use this for public exhibitions. So Edison had his staff make a few prototypes. This is an original prototype. <clears throat> then he decided that the ideal place to put this phonograph onto the market, the first phonograph ever sold, was going to be at the Paris Exposition in 1878, which started in May. So he shipped one of these prototypes to his agent in Paris, Theodore Paskus, and said, find a machinist, make the machine, sell it, and he did. And this was the first phonograph ever sold to the public. <clears throat> it was made, it was constructed by a French machinist by the name of Edme Hardy, who was already doing work for Edison's company in Europe. It was put on the market for the equivalent of $40. Um, Hardy actually signed a contract with Theodore Roosevelt's uncle to distribute them, and it was a colossal failure. <clears throat> the reality of the, of the story was that although this functioned very well uh, on a limited basis, um, it was totally impractical, and $40 was a lot of money. So very few of these were sold. He did have a few made in the United States by Sigmund Bergman, who was a principal machinist, uh, outside machinist that Edison worked with. <clears throat> exact same machine that American built. Um, as a little sidebar, this is kind of, I think, curious. This machine was purchased by Alexander Graham Bell and was used as the basis of the first graphophone, which would later be Edison's nightmare, just by putting wax in the grooves. But that's a story for another time. <clears throat> The main story is that for all of its novelty, this was a completely impractical device and it faded from the market very, very quickly. The real plan was exhibitions. The idea was that since there was very little you could do with the tinfoil phonograph, you could make a recording, you could play it back. That's it. You couldn't save it, you couldn't replace it. So they hired, or they created the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company they hired James Redpath as general manager on a six-month contract, and his job was to divide up the United States into territories, find exhibitors who would buy the rights to the territory, and buy phonographs, 
present exhibitions all over the country, charge admission, and pay royalties back to Edison. Um, <clears throat> territories were $100, 25% uh, of the income was paid back to the company. And they proceeded, starting in May, to have presentations all over the country, and they were wildly popular. The problem was they really didn't have a standardized machine <clears throat> phonograph to use for these. There were a, a series of machines made by various local machinists that the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company contracted <laughs> with. So here's an example from the Hope Machine Works in Newark, New Jersey, an example from Partrick and Carter in New York. Basically all the same idea, very, very simple. No flywheel, very large mandrel that was very heavy, which helped to control the speed because it acts as its own flywheel. Uh, a little bit awkward to use, but this was the design. Edison was not pushing for an improved design at this point because he had a different plan. He was going to make the improved phonograph using discs, still with a sheet of tinfoil, but instead of being wrapped around a mandrel, it was going to be used with discs, and with a spring motor. And he devoted a tremendous amount of time and effort to the disc phonograph, but ultimately it was never produced. It was a complete failure. And Edison staff had to go back <clears throat> to the original exhibition machine and start making improvements because exhibitors were complaining left and right. First improvement that was made was adding a flywheel. That was a big help. But then in June, they started adding newer ideas to it. And this was a machine that was made by a machinist called Alex Poole in Newark huge flywheel, and they added here on the left what I call a throw-out lever, which I'll talk about in a little bit uh, more detail in a moment. The biggest improvement that they made was simply cutting a slot right across the center of the mandrel. Up till now, when exhibitors are doing exhibitions, and as you will see, wrapping the sheet of tin foil, it takes very time consuming, but they had to then, with shellac or sealing wax, seal one edge, wrap it around, seal the other edge with an overlap. A lot of work. This slot allowed the ends of the foil to simply be crimped in, wedged in, boom, done. Much quicker. So that was a monstrous improvement. Then in July, they took it further and came out with what I consider one of the key improvements. I'll show a little more detail of that. A tilt speaker. So here we have a machine. This is an early exhibition machine from May that has been modified. They've changed the speaker, they've added the flywheel, which is so big it's hanging over the edge of the table. Uh, they've added a throw-out lever on the end, which is to reposition the mandrel more quickly instead of having to wind it all the way back each time. So this is a big improvement. Here's another example of a Bergman-made machine from May that was modified in July <coughs> with improvements to make it much simpler to use. The big improvement was changing the speaker. This is uh, typical of all the early machines. They were anchored on the left with a lever, which is all well and good. It's easy enough to pull it back, put the tinfoil on, and lock it back in place. The problem is depth adjustment is very sensitive, and every time you adjust the depth on these, it would change the centering. So every adjustment became a massive, complex operation. By making a tilt forward, now the speaker can be centered and locked, and the depth on the screw here can be adjusted separately and changed with no problem. It won't affect this, uh, the rest of it. And then the throwout lever. And I said this was simply to make it simpler. Early ones, they had to wind the mandrel back. Here you could just unlatch it, pull it back, and relatch it, and you're up and running. <clears throat> Now, finally, in September, we reached the, the peak of the tinfoil development. This was what became, for the very brief remaining life of the phonograph, literally only months, the exhibition phonograph. A huge, heavy, solid machine with every possible improvement. <clears throat> they were made by Sigmund Bergman, under contract. Three versions were made, cast iron, uh, also cast iron with some brass parts, brass speaker, and then for $200, solid brass. This was the deluxe instrument with inlaid rosewood cabinet and was called the drawing room instrument. 
The only problem was the novelty was wearing off. <clears throat> By then, everybody had seen a phonograph. You pay your quarter, you'd go to an exhibition, you'd see it talk, and you'd say, wow, that's pretty exciting. But you really didn't have any desire to go back and see it again because it's a one-trick pony. So the crowds started to dwindle. The price started to drop. Now we're down to 10 cents, trying to get people to come in. But its day had come and gone in an incredibly short period of time. <clears throat> Literally in a year, the phonograph, the tinfoil phonograph, had peaked and died. So the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company, in desperation, went back to the idea of selling phonographs to the public. They created a design that was very small, only about six inches wide on the base, that could be easily used and sold for $15 <coughs> soon lowered to 10 because there was simply no demand. This is an example of one of these so-called parlor models. And again, it was a great idea, but it was so impractical that even at $10, there was really no public market for it. And the sales simply tanked, and the tinfoil phonograph <coughs> died out. By then, Edison was already out of the picture. He had signed a contract in November of 1878, formally terminated his involvement with the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company, so the Speaking Phonograph Company simply dwindled away during 1879 and shut their doors in 1880, and the tinfoil phonograph was a dead entity at that point. But what we want to do now is to try and show what it was like for the people in September 1878, so we're going to step back in time. <laughs> and Clear your minds of all your 21st century thoughts, all of your knowledge of sound, and let's go back to September 1878. Welcome to this demonstration. I'm going to show you something today which you're going to find positively unbelievable. <laughs> I want to tell you right up front, this is not magic. This is not ventriloquism. This is not wizardry. Although it has been said that Professor Thomas Edison, the inventor of the phonograph or speaking machine, is a wizard of Menlo Park. But this is really simply a miracle of modern 19th century science. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you. Now, it has been said that Mr. Edison's very first words into the very first phonograph were a bit of practical poetry, as he called it. And for your benefit, I'm going to recreate Professor Edison's first recording. Hello, hello, hello. Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Ha, ha, ha! Now, I urge you to please hold on to your seats, for what you're about to experience has caused grown men to tremble, has terrified women and children, for you are going to hear the actual sound from a machine, yet yeah, this is a machine that talks. Just as the waves of the ocean wash upon the shores of the Pacific, the waves of sound wash upon a mica diaphragm, which vibrates in tune with those waves of sound and causes a steel needle to impress markings into a sheet of tin foil. This makes a permanent record of sound. Sound is no longer ephemeral. Song, sound no longer needs to disappear the moment that it has been uttered. Speech can be repeated for generations to come. 
This is truly a miracle of modern science. Now I'd like to invite Professor Feaster to come over <clears throat> and give us an example of a lecture into the speaking phonograph. <laughs> and I have never done this before. <laughs> The sacredness of the family tie is the condition both of the physical soundness and the moral vigor of nations. The family is the miniature commonwealth upon whose integrity the safety of the larger commonwealth depends. It is the seed plot of all morality in the child's intercourse with its parents. The sentiment of reverence is instilled, the essence of all piety, all idealism. Also, the habit of obedience to rightful authority, which forms so invaluable a feature in the character of the loyal citizen. <clears throat> now, no proper, <laughs> no proper lecture <laughs> would be complete without a heckler. <laughs> So we shall introduce a heckler <laughs> to our presentation. I dry up. What are you giving us? <laughs> Go hire a hall. Get out. Woo, woo, woo. Go, yo, go, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> Give us a rest. Shh, shh. I want to go home. Oh, Charlie. <laughs> Let go my hair. Police, police. Fire, fire, fire. Look at his nose. To ralu ralu, to ralu ralady, to ralu ralu, to ralu ralady. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the lecture in its proper form. <laughs> <laughs> capable of singing. It is not merely for speech. Do we have a singer who would like to please? <laughs> sing? <laughs> sing into the horn. <laughs> okay.
the sheet of tin foil has been completely recorded. So we will need to attach another. That sheet will be available down the side of the The foil must be absolutely smooth. Okay. <laughs> now we'd like to show you that the machine is also capable of playing instrumental music. So to that end, we have invited a trumpeter to present a little piece for us. <laughs> didn't, you, didn't your advertisement say cornet? Ah, I'm sorry, yes, cornet. <laughs> I brought a trumpet, which... I predict we'll supersede the cornet in the future. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Stay a little closer. Okay. Okay. Terribly loud. Go ahead and just go right up to the, to the horn. Play closer to the horn. <clears throat> right up to the horn. I've never experimented with a cornet before. Nor have I recorded on tin foil. <laughs> <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your kind attention. I hope you have enjoyed this experience of seeing the Edison speaking phonograph. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope